Well, Risk Profile and Tech Rodeo, I really appreciate you joining us. We're here with Quentin Donnellan. He's a VP at the intersection of space and technology at Hypergiant, which has offices throughout Texas. He's joining us remotely from North Dallas, and he's here to talk about uh, his role in developing artificial technology to solve core problems. Uh, Quentin, thanks so much for joining us. Mark, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, it's been really exciting to aggregate all of the movers and shakers in technology here in Houston through this uh, platform. Uh, you guys have an office in Houston. Do you mind kind of going through uh, what it is you guys do? Yeah, thanks, Mark. Yeah, you know, Hypergiant, we have our hands kind of uh, in all of the pies, so to speak, across the ML spectrum. But really what we do is we like to say we we bring clients their intelligence transformation, right? And so big buzzwords over the last decade or so has been this concept of digital transformation, right? Like taking uh, a client whose processes are very manual connecting that with the internet, allowing them to utilize software tools that have really you know, made economies here most efficient. Um, but on the other side of the digital transformation is kind of the next industrial revolution, right? Like everyone says like AI is the next industrial revolution. So bringing a company who has gone from the digital transformation step to the intelligence transformation step, and that is utilizing the data sets that you have to really generate more efficiency using machine learning algorithms, artificial intelligence algorithms, or business analytics, business insights, business intelligence, right? So it's it's taken a company who has, who has made the step to be digital, to connect with the internet, to utilize software tools, and then add smarts, right? Like add intelligence to actually tease out every ounce of, of intelligence. Um, we execute that kind of in three different ways. One of them is like a consulting firm services. So we come in and we 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 examined where you are in that that transformational journey. Are you still stuck in paperwork? I'm looking at you, finance and real estate, right? Like, are you still stuck in a manual on paper process? And if you are, then we have to actually do that that digital transformation journey for you. If you're in that digital transformation stage, then like, let's see where your data sets are. Do you even have a data science team? Um, what can we provide for you that actually makes you jump from you know that digital step to that intelligent step? And then, of course, we have some companies, you know, large enterprises that are currently executing with data science teams and machine learning teams. And so we actually bring increased efficiencies, maybe providing ML models that are that are customized for that particular customer or whatnot. So so that's the kind of that that consulting or the, the, the consulting phase. And then below that, we also have services where actually we provide applications and tools that we build custom for you. So it's beyond just the here's what you could do. It's we will actually provide that 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 platform for you. Um, you know, Hypergiant has a rich history in game as well. Um, the previous company that kind of Hypergiant spun out of, um, you know, we brought a lot of game designers and game developers. <clears throat> excuse me. So developing rich human computer interactive immersive environments is tremendously import important from the intelligence transformation point of view because you can't just throw machine learning and autonomous systems in with companies who have traditionally used human operators. You talk about Houston. Houston has a tremendous rich history in space, right? Space operations down at Johnson Space Center. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna replace those people with with automation. Like the aerospace industry would just completely reject it because from a risk point of view, you can't trust things that you can't touch and see, right? And so so where where we come in is we provide interfaces that allow a human operator to still sit in that seat but interact kind of intuitively with those intelligence agents that are happening behind the scenes. And honestly, I think that that's where the future of, of AI really is, is collaboration between human and autonomous agents. You know, there's a lot of popular fear around artificial intelligence. You know, in the movies, we see things like Terminator and Skynet. And I think this is something you guys intuitively understand. Don't you name your conference rooms after some of the villains uh, in these AI plots? Yes, I mean, we're, we're, we're geeky nerds, so we do stuff like that, right? <laughs> But in the context of what AI is and what it actually does, uh, especially given the misinformation out there, would you mind going through a tangible example of an ex of how artificial intelligence is really like a machine, uh, uh, you know, industrial revolution where it really does increase the productivity, uh, and just in that way make it tangible for us to understand? Yeah. So you know, the tough thing with AI and ML from a public perception point of view. 
Um, and I would say even internal to companies who are spending a lot of money on AI and ML is that it seems like magic, right? The public perception is like the Skynet thing or the Terminator with the red eyes, right? Like you're afraid of it because you don't know what it does because it's, it's somewhat unexplainable, right? You throw data in a big bucket on one side, some machines are crunching the data and out the other side, you get some sort of insight or intelligent action. Um, and I think that's one of the big troubles with, with machine learning is that, um, and artificial intelligence to a larger extent, is that it can be perceived as a black box. Um, and so one of the things that, that Hypergiant wants to do is kind of demystify that, right? Um, if you add intelligence to a business process, but it's not explainable, then how, how useful is that? What happens when it breaks? Um, and from the public perception point of view, I and mean, people actually are going to be thinking about AI as Skynet. Like there, there could be a, a fear of that. People are afraid of losing their jobs. People are afraid of facial recognition being racist or biased. People are afraid of uh, fraud detection algorithms um, inappropriately denying someone a credit application just because uh, you know their social profile led to a higher risk analysis. Right? Um, those are all. Th those are huge ethical ethical concerns. Um, their trust concerns, um, and so you know, I, being able to being able to explain AI, being able to you know deliver trust so that a business that brings in AI still doesn't lose the trust of their stakeholders, um, it's it's huge it's hugely important. Absolutely. So let's go through some business cases, things that Hypergiant has done recently with artificial intelligence that you know is a little bit more uh, tangible. Yeah, I'll talk about um, some of the stuff we've done with satellite imagery. Um, and, and we could we could pivot however you want, um, but you know one of the um, and this kind of falls in the custom machine learning model, computer vision model development category. Um, we uh, we spent a little bit of time working on ingesting damage uh, Im images from a damaged area. So think about uh, Hurricane. Uh, I think it was Michael that went through the Panhandle in Florida, uh, destroyed uh, an Air Force base there, right? Um, or the the Beirut explosion, right? Um, so one of, one of the great things about satellites is that they pass over a large swath of the earth all the time, um, really quickly. So we are actually able to collect global images of the earth um, in such a way that any, any place, maybe with the exception of some of the, the polar regions, but any place on earth probably has satellites imaging it all the time, um, at least daily. Um, and so what you could do is you could take an image of a region, whether it's an Air Force base on the Florida Panhandle or Beirut, um, before and after a natural disaster. Um, and so what we were able to do is we were able to produce a computer vision algorithm, which basically takes that image beforehand, takes the image afterwards, and does an assessment on a building by building level of which buildings were more damaged, which buildings were least damaged. Um, so that, that's, that's, that's an example of a computer vision machine learning model that operates on images and produces classification. Is this building damaged? Is this building in this specific spot damaged? How damaged is it? Um, and then those insights could be forwarded to maybe insurance adjusters to understand uh, the level of total damage in a particular area. Could be in real time fed to uh, first responders, go to the houses that are most damaged first, et cetera. Um, so that's kind of that's that's an example of the type of machine learning models um, that you can actually deliver uh, using satellite imagery. Mm -hmm. So to me, you know, let's just take away the terminology. You know, that example, you know, an analyst can physically look at those images and classify them, and you don't really need to apply artificial intelligence uh, to to finish that. But obviously, when you're doing that same process at scale, it changes things quite a bit. Right, so let, let's talk about scale, right? And, and the Beirut example is potentially a, ba a bad use for the computer vision because when, when a global event like that happens, like the entire world's eyes is on that one city, right? I can't tell you how many like YouTube videos popped up of people actually filming the explosion as it was happening, right? So in that particular case, you had all these eyes there, right? But what happens when a small storm blows through, you know, a small rural town in Northeastern Oklahoma or Southern Missouri, right? You're not gonna get the national press there may be only a couple homes that were damaged, right? And you're not going to have an analyst who can watch every home in every city in the world, right? And so to me, that's the power of AI, right? Like when you go beyond like things that everyone is watching into 
the things that most people aren't watching, which is every house all the time, every time a satellite passes over anywhere on the earth, I could theoretically be, you know, sending data to insurance risk adjusters or claims adjusters or first responders because some event that I wasn't expecting, hurricanes you can kind of anticipate, you, you see them coming, right? Um, but there are other things that just happen. Sinkholes just happen. Um, thunderstorms just kind of happen, you know I mean? And, and they happen at a scale that you, you just can't commit an entire fleet of human operators to be monitoring all the things. So to me, like that's that's where it gets really interesting, and that's where machine learning or AI uh, can can really um, can really scale up that that level of alerting. So let's kind of walk back to the perception of your question as well. I could easily see why a client like the CIA would want artificial intelligence, but let's compare the perception of artificial intelligence and maybe the reality. Like, where is the technology at this point? Should we be concerned about AI replacing jobs? Or is it really uh, not quite there at that point? It really needs a lot of uh, development. You know, where's the where's the reality here? There are a lot of things there, and, and some of these questions are very loaded. Uh, but to be perfectly honest, um, there is a gap between how AI operates and the public perception. Um, people are, um, and I would say rightfully so in some cases, um, afraid of AI because they don't understand it. And to me, I think this is the biggest failing of AI and, and machine learning. Um, is that for the most part, people throw around AI and ML as buzzwords. Um, they say, you know, we are using AI or we using ML. They don't explain it. They say it's core to their business or they say that we're funding it within my industrial vertical at a certain level. Um, but it's really just buzzwordy. And when it gets down to an actual model, um, it's not explained. Um, that's the challenge that, that we're getting into. And so, yes, of course, there's a gap. Um, AI is absolutely doing some of the things you mentioned. We have AI artists out there right now. You, go, you Google AI artistry, um, it's a thing that's happening. It's been happening for years, right? Um, it's different than, than human artwork, right? Um, and so I think that that's interesting. Um, AI also um, is performing work that humans have previously performed. This is just kind of a fact of, of automation, right? Um, but when I look at AI, and let's take Johnson Space Center in Houston or Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, for example, um, when you bring AI into a place like Johnson Space Center, right, the goal is, of course, not to replace the human workforce. The goal is to take that human workforce and leverage it um, to be able to execute at a level that it couldn't before. Um, so instead of going from a room of hundreds of engineers managing a single flight or hundreds of engineers managing um, you know, a constellation of, of 10 satellites, you can now take that same room of engineers, um, probably add a bunch of data scientists and machine learning engineers as well, and now you can manage constellations of thousands of satellites. Um, or now most of the satellites manage themselves, but those hu those, those, that room of human operators now deal with the things that human brains should really be dealing with, and that is not the tedious pushing a button task, but solving the really hard problems. Um, you know, kind of like the, the Gene Kranz Apollo 13, like let's all get in a room and solve a problem. AI is not gonna solve those problems for you. AI is gonna be able to tell you, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Oops, I think I'm bad, someone help me out, right? Um, so to me, I think that's, that's where, you know, that, that intersection of human operators solving the really complex, we need a human brain for this problem. And, you know, autonomous systems, that, that kind of just assist when nothing is in that region. I think, I think that's where you, you take someplace like NASA um, and, and really take it to the next level. So kind of referencing machine learning, you know, I think in order for this to work, you have to have a consistent set of inputs and a consistent set of classified outputs. Isn't it kind of like the, when we get those, are you a human being questions where we're having to click on the squares with bicycles or cars or whatnot, are we really training these algorithms? Yes. Um, Sometimes, uh, but you, you know the 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 output of machine learning uh, is certainly a function of the inputs, right? Um, one of the inputs is the data set. Yes, the other input are the labels. Um, if you have a computer vision algorithm that can detect uh, damage on a building from space, for example, or you can detect a stop sign in an image, or you can detect that there's a triangle here, right? So on that reCAPTCHA, which image has a triangle? This one, right? Um, somewhere down the line, you had to have a human like actually input 
this image has a triangle or this building is damaged at 20% or something like that, right? Um, there are algorithms out there that can actually do some form of auto labeling as well. Um, and, and this, but, but I think to, to your point, AI and ML, um, though it will automate some tasks previously done by humans, it also necessitates a bunch of tasks to be performed by humans to, to make it work. Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing where, you know, it, it's the, the advent of new jobs. And of course you read in the article, it says the number of AI or ML jobs, um, needed far exceeds the supply of human workers. Just kind of jumping into the next related topic, when I think of artificial intelligence, one of the things that comes to mind is the US versus China arms race, if you will, in artificial intelligence. And there are definitely firms here in the US like Palantir that are making a lot of inroads. You know, what about Texas is, uh, you know, relevant in why is there artificial intelligence uh, uh, here? Is there something uh, unique about where we are and where we sit? Yeah, so I think a, a couple things to note um, from the Texas point of view. You know, Texas has a, a very rich tradition, obviously in, in space down down in Houston. Um, but you know, Austin is becoming, of course, a tech capital of the world. Um, San Antonio has a huge uh, security and DevOps and you know cyber program down there, um, sponsored by the Air Force. Um, I think many people aren't aware of that space. You know, they they recently placed Space Command in Huntsville, Alabama, but San Antonio, Texas, was one of the front runners for um, for Space Command. Um, and you know, Dallas has a huge industrial base. Um, basically, every Fortune five hundred has five hundred company has, a, has an office in Dallas. So, so Texas is a really great place where you get the broad spectrum of cyber, digital, space footprint. Um, it would be hard to find a place that's, that's maybe a, a better breeding ground um, for innovation. And of course, Texas is incredibly business friendly. So we've got all that going for you. Um, when it comes to space, you know, everyone loves to think of, of Space Force as kind of the Steve Carell boots on the moon type thing. In reality, Space Force is a software force. Um, space Force is operated by I'm going to go ahead and, and round up here, but 100% of people behind computer screens doing um, you know, warfare on the digital front. Satellites are up in space, sure. They're collecting data and they're sending it back down to people operating behind computer screens. Uh, so when we talk about the space race or the next space race, or when we talk about you know, China versus the United States or the United States versus Russia or emerging companies, uh, countries coming up and, and trying to launch space programs, we're talking about software. You know, we're talking about software in space. We're talking about collecting data and using that data. And when we talk about data, we're really talking about insights from the earth, right? You go up to space, it's the high ground, you take images, you collect radar signatures. Um, you're, you know, you're detecting interesting things about the earth and the, and the space around your spacecraft, but you're sending that down to be processed on, on the earth via, via software algorithms. So space force, space warfare, uh, the, the next space race, however you want to call it, it's a software problem. Um, it's a cybersecurity problem. And that's what people are talking about when they're talking about, you know, U.S. versus China and, and this next advent of, of space things in the future. So how did you find your way? I mean, you can't exactly go to school to, and graduate from a top AI lab. How did you, how'd you get a job in this industry? Great question. I, I love to talk about careers. Um, you know, my, my dad spent 20 years, 20 plus years in the Navy. And, and I think, um, you know, that 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 generation of folks has this eye of like, you do one thing for 20 or 30 years, like that's your career. My career has definitely not been that. Um, so I'll, I'll, work, I'll work backwards a bit. You know, I've been at Hypergiant for a couple of years now. Before that, I worked at several companies kind of in a capacity to lead software engineering teams and projects across retail, aerospace, ed tech, uh, privacy engineering, uh, marketing engineering, kind of you name it. Um, before that, I was actually a high school teacher I taught calculus, engineering, design, astronomy, physics, geometry. Um, kind of in my off time, I also went down the, the founder experience. So I built a couple startups, including a after school. We teach middle schoolers robotics and, and programming. Um, before that, I spent some time at, at NASA JPL doing research on optics. Before that, I was at A&M um, doing work uh, in aerospace engineering. Um, my one of my, my research professors at AM was working on an, uh, an optics project, uh, space-based imaging. Um, we did some stuff for 
kind of National Science Foundation. We did some stuff for uh, the Air Force. Um, I left that project, must be 20 years ago now. Um, and, a, and a couple years ago, I got a call because uh, he was working with some guys um, who ended up, you know, at Hypergiant. So weird things happen, right? So I get this call and say, hey, uh, was so-and-so your professor back when you were at a and and I was like, yes, why? And he was like, well, we're working on his project and we think you were one of the only people that actually knew what was going on there. Um, so one thing led to another and, uh, and I came to Hypergiant. And we flew some experiments last year uh, under Hypergiant to kind of you know, advance the science of that project. So um, it's crazy how things work out. Um, my career path is not a straight line. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, and that's you now that that's that's kind of that. It's been it's been a fun ride. Wow, what'd you come up with at A and M? I mean, uh, wh what led you specifically uh, with your research in uh, in order to get into Hypergiant? Well, I didn't come up with anything. I just I just saw cool things and said I want to work on that. Right? Um, what 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 we were working on then was um, interferometry, um, and essentially the the concept of interferometry is instead of building giant telescopes with these huge you know, 30 meter, you know, ground glass or um, segmented mirrors, uh, you actually take small telescopes and they're disconnected and they're all recording images in infrared or optical, excuse me, <coughs> and you combine their signals digitally, right? So the concept is solving problems with software instead of solving problems with giant mirrors. Um, and as it turns out, it's a very complex problem. Um, but if you do the math correctly, um, several small satellites, or excuse me, several small telescopes that could be on satellites, um, collecting data from different places on the Earth can actually produce an image that looks as high resolution as an image collected from a telescope that was as, as large, like one big old thing of, of glass or, or a mirror or something like that. Um, so that, that, was, that was that project. Yep. So just stepping back into, you know, where you're able to take advantage of artificial intelligence, it seems to me like if you have a process that's sufficiently painful uh, and is well ordered, you can really start to apply some of these concepts and come up with a solution that can maybe uh, show you some things in the data that you wouldn't otherwise see. And I can really understand that. In some ways, yes. Um, you know, machine learning, one of the things that machine learning does a really great job at is detecting patterns, right? So if you have, a, a, you have enough data um, and there is a pattern in the data, then machine learning can detect that pattern. Um, software inherently can scale more cheaply um, and um, with a greater ceiling than, than human workforce, right? And so um, just like the Industrial Re Revolution, um, you build a machine, <clears throat> Excuse me. That that machine can now do the work of a hundred men or a thousand men or however you want to call it. Software can do the work of essentially an, an infinite number of men um, and women as long as you have uh, enough power to feed the GPUs that are running that are running machine learning. Um, in some in some regards, though, machine learning is kind of weirder, right? Um, and and that is some of the patterns um, are not intuitive. There, you know, sometimes. You know, when, when I look at a, an assembly line or when I look at the Industrial Revolution, it's like we knew exactly what we had to do. Humans were doing it. We replaced it with machine. It was a very well-defined process, as you put. Um, machine learning, however, if you have the data, can actually find patterns that we didn't know existed. Um, and, and moreover, you can actually stitch together multiple data sources and discover things that you never knew were there. And to me, I think that's the true power of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And that is doing something that humans couldn't actually do in the first place, right? Um, and that is discovering things that are not intuitive. Uh, discovering things that take inputs from, from data sources that um, you know, human labor could never stitch together. Um, an example from, from space, for example, is that you know, we have a lot of telecommunication, telecommunication satellites flying all across the earth. Those telecommunications, telecommunication satellites are mainly receiving packets of data from somewhere on the earth, forwarding them to somewhere else. So that if I'm a sat satellite phone operator, I can you know, pull up a Jeep in the middle of the Sahara and I have internet connectivity, right? But all they're doing is just internet service. Um, but what they're also doing is collecting signal strength data across the earth. 
kind of as a byproduct, right? Because if you're a network operator, you're operating radios, you detect when a signal is strong or weak. That signal data can actually be used to predict weather patterns, right? Um, if signals are weak, um, that could, for example, uh, represent presence of a storm or increased humidity um, or increased uh, soil moisture content over an agricultural field, for example. And it's that sort of really bizarre insight um, that a human might be able to figure that out, um, monitoring things, you know, kind of matrix style. You know, all I see is this or this, you know, after staring at it for a long time. But really, that that's not what that's not what what humans are good for. But that's that's really it's 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 a thing that that machine learning is incredibly uh, good at. Which is if there's a pattern in data, no matter how strange that pattern is, correlating signal strength data to you know moisture content in the air, it can find it. And I think that's that's where mu machine learning is going to be really um, you know that that weird side of it's not a defined process. We didn't know there was anything here to start with, but machine learning or, or AI can find it. So maybe just addressing the fear mongering, you know, that China is pouring so much money into artificial intelligence and they're going to win and they're going to own everything. You know, uh, can you, it doesn't really sound like, you know, just throwing money at this kind of a problem is, is really going to be a solution. You really have to have an idea and a real problem and then uh, create a solution. Is, is, is all this fear mongering uh, legitimate? Should we be concerned? I, I don't know if, if I, I quite get the question, but I, I do think that, you know, when, when you look at the, the power of AI, and the power that a company that wields a you know a huge budget exerted at at AI and really really intelligence kind of in, in the broader sense being able to collect data, um, that country or that entity is going to have a tremendous amount of power over those who aren't doing that right. Um, and, and and the idea you know just from an economic point of view, for example, um, if you were generating a ton of data and there are patterns in the data, then from a financial forecasting point of view, from an efficiency optimization point of view, you can do things that countries that aren't collecting that data and aren't you know, exerting machine learning research to discover patterns in the data just simply can't do. Those companies, are, those, those companies or those countries will have an edge over those who aren't. Um, and the edge may, you know, may surface itself as more efficient markets, um, more um, kind of better prognostication abilities, being able to essentially see the future before others can. Um, and so I, I don't think there's there's a limit to how much money you could spend on AI or ML and get a get a you know positive return on that investment. Um, I think what we're going to see is that you know China is 100% willing to spend a ton of money in AI and ML. Um, they are willing to spend a ton of money on space. Um, and if the United States is not willing to meet that kind of commitment, we're going to we're going to find ourselves behind. Um, at the same time, though, and there's an asterisk here, you can't do this without losing public's trust, right? Uh, because if all you're doing is spending billions of dollar on what you would call AI infrastructure or next generation intelligence or machine learning, but you don't you don't bring along, you know, public you know, kind of perception and try to foster that trust, then what you're building from the lay, the lay person's view is Skynet, right? Or what you're building is the thing that's going to destroy us all, right? Um, and so there, there's a challenge there. Maybe if you're a China, you're more willing to just accept that and just say, don't trust it, we're just doing it. If you're the United States, where trust is incredibly important and not getting trust means that, you know, you're, you will lose your budget at the next election. Um, you, you, you kind of have to do that. And so, and, and I think that's important too. Now, just thinking about somebody that's uh, looking at their own career, you know, if they're looking at, you know, out in the future in the next some years, uh, is, is artificial intelligence really part of a core skill set? And, and if they need to start developing that, how do they get started? Like, what should they do? Well, first they should give me a call and we could talk about that. Um, but, you know, the biggest thing is no one is operating their business at maximum efficiency. Um, I've yet to see it, right? Um, and at the same time, many businesses are spending a ton of money on AI and ML, and the money is simply going to waste. Um, people, you, people can't explain the benefit of or the return on investment of AI and ML. You've got a CIO or a CTO who says, I read a Gartner report or a Forrester report that says 
you need to spend X percent of your, you know, your yearly budget on AI and ML. So I threw the money in there and I don't really have any visibility into, is this actually delivering business value? Um, and so my recommendation, and this is of course something that, that Hypergiant prides itself on, is, is trying to connect the dots, right? You spend a dollar on AI and ML, how is that improving your business efficiency? How is that delivering business value? How is that, how is that raising the awareness of, of business intelligence? And that's another thing is you may not actually increase business efficiency to start with, but you may learn a whole lot about how things are working. If machine learning inherently discovers patterns in your business process, it discovers a pattern. Now you know something that you didn't know before. Oh, when the data looks like this, my business does something like this. That's incredibly valuable, even if that machine learning algorithm doesn't, doesn't affect uh, you know, ROI immediately. As it turns out, when you learn how your business operates, you are going to become more efficient as well. So that's the biggest thing I would say is um, don't think about AI and ML as buzzwords. Don't just throw money at it and just you know cross your fingers and hope that I've got a, I've got all this data. I've got terabytes of data. Like I'm going to be more efficient. Like no, you, you have to be connecting the dots between business KPIs, whatever metrics you're using that tell you whether or not a thing you changed del delivered value. Um, and, and your machine learning, your programs. And, and I think that that's a better way to go. You know, do you feel like uh, with machine learning that this is a really specialized skill set, or is this something everybody should really be able to pick up and, 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 and do? Well, I think, it's, I think it's important to understand that as with any career, you know, there is a spectrum of things you could do. Um, on the left side is someone who's completely unskilled in that thing. And on the right side, you've got your, your PhDs and several master's degrees people who are really narrowly focused on this very one thing and they're the best in the world, right? You do definitely, you definitely don't need to be one of those. Um, and, you know, in the world of ML today, um, if you have any ability to download something from the internet and right click and run it, um, you can actually deliver business value in the form of, you know, ML finding patterns and data sets. Um, there are ML, there are pre-trained ML algorithms right now in model zoos across the internet that you can download and do simple things um, like detecting a flower of a certain type or detecting if there are people in an image. You know, a lot of what Facebook engineering does is, is delivering you know, people recognition um, models. You give it an image and it tells you, is there a person? Facebook would actually tell you which person it is and if they're happy or sad or about to break up with their girlfriend or something, right? But there are models that exist that you do not need to build, you do not need to train, you, you do not need to have a PhD in, in machine learning. And my recommendation for someone who wants to get into machine learning or wants to get into data science or wants to get into business analytics um, is just go for it. Like, don't, don't feel held back because you don't have a PhD from Stanford, as you mentioned earlier. That's not going to be a thing that, that is really a gatekeeper. Um, there are companies out there that won't hire you if you don't have a PhD. Um, who cares? You're currently employed by a company. And if you deliver business value or business intelligence for your employer, they're going to be excited about that. Um, and so I would say just go for it. I mean, uh, that's amazing. Just kind of thinking about your position, where, what you're looking at right now, what do you see on the horizon? Are you excited about uh, space, AI? What do you think, what do you hope to see? Yeah, so in, the biggest thing is, is my hope to see space adopt AI and ML. Um, <clears throat> when, when I look at a Tesla drive down the road, for example, the Tesla is jam-packed with modern sensors, um, GPUs, um, connectivity to home base, for example. Some of those things exist on satellite platforms, many of them do not. Um, GPUs in space, um, because they haven't been rigorously rad hardened or you know, thermally hardened, um, they, they haven't really been flown in, in large numbers. And, and when you don't have a GPU in space, it's hard to put a neural network in space, or it's hard to put a computer vision algorithm in space. Um, and to a larger extent, kind of, you know, space included, but, but really, you know, the entire world right now is, is viewing machine learning in a very common pattern. And that is your device on the edge is streaming data to the cloud, right? Um, of course, when we say the cloud, we need some data center like Microsoft Azure or AWS or whatever, but you're, you're constantly streaming data and then, um, you've got data scientists who after the fact crunch on that data and produce a model and that model um, delivers insights like, is there a person in this picture or am I about to hit a tree or something like that? Um, but in space, you don't necessarily have access to a cloud. 
right? You can't necessarily stream data at the same fidelity or the same resolution to a massive data center because they simply don't exist. They don't exist in space. Um, in low Earth orbit, you're traveling at you know seven kilometers a second. Um, you're traveling at you know four four miles a second or whatever, and, and so you don't necessarily have the duration of link between a ground station to to you know barf all of your images to that cloud. Um, so how do you solve the problem? Um, and so kind of what I'm excited for in the future is you know this this concept of keeping the data on the edge, um, training the data on on the satellite. Letting the satellite interact with a locally a local network of other satellites so that they can collaborate on the data they've collected without having to you know talk back to cloud or without having to talk back to ground to be able to to get smarter um, and deliver kind of in, in intelligent assets. Um, of course, when you're talking about a lunar station or Mars, um, the problems get get even worse. If I'm on Mars, I'm not. I mean, it, it takes 30 minutes or, or so just to send something back and get a response, right? Like, I'm not going to be streaming, you know, uh, a video stream to Earth and, and hoping that I'm getting actual insights. Like, I've got to make a decision in the next two seconds. I can't rely on AWS, right? And so that's, that's, that's the future of AI and ML on the edge. Um, Hyperdrain is trying to solve a lot of those problems. Um, how do we deliver AI and ML when you, when you don't have the backhaul network? Um, to those IoT devices, whether that's space or precision agriculture or DOD or healthcare, where sending data back is actually blocked by policy, right? Um, so a lot of these things are kind of, that's the future of AI and ML. Don't assume you have a, a, a big connection to AWS or Microsoft or Google or whatever. Solving those problems kind of on a disconnected edge is, is where we're, we're focused and I'm excited about. I mean, how about, how do people reach out to you? I mean, how would you like to hear from somebody that wants to ask you some more questions? Uh, so I direct them to our website, hypergiant.com. Um, uh, we've got contact information there. Um, I'm, I'm fascinated about any and all problems. You know, one of the great things about Hypergiant is that I, I'm super passionate about space. I'm really passionate about helping, you know, Department of Defense solve their problems. But I'm also interested in, in solving, you know, in, in understanding things that I've, I've never, like, had experienced before, like precision agriculture, which you're getting into right now. That's not something I would have said as a kid, I want to get into agriculture, right? Um, but the problems there are so critical to the survival of, of humanity uh, and, and delivering efficiencies uh, delivers a tremendous impact to the globe. Um, and, and, and that's just one example of, of millions. And so I, what I would ask if you go to Hypergiant and you look at our, one of our email addresses or phone numbers, um, I just want to know what's your business use case? Like where are you collecting data and what, what are your pain points? Um, and then, you know, we work together to figure out how can we deliver intelligence to you or to your business. Um, and I'm, ex I'm excited about all things. Don't think that because you don't have a satellite, you can't, you can't leverage a high tech solution. Um, and and that, that, that would be what I would say. Yeah. Hey, Quentin, thank you so much for your time. This has really been helpful for me as I think about how some of these terminologies have been thrown around in the media and, and uh, what is uh, really the truth. So I really appreciate your time. All right, Tech Rodeo, go be someone. Absolutely, Mark. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure.